A year ago, I was working out on a Peloton because it was a pandemic, and I was studying about Bitcoin because it was a pandemic, and I was listening to a podcast by Peter McCormick about the Lightning Network. And I was blown away, and I got off the, phone, the podcast, and I called Ross Stevens of NIDIG, our sponsor, and I said, can they really do that? Because if they can really do that, this is so much bigger than I realized. And he said, they can do that. You have to speak to Elizabeth Stark. So here we are. Um, what is the Lightning Network? No E, by the way. Lightning without an E. Um, and why is it important? Uh, thanks, Brett. First of all, it's so incredible to be here today um, as a New Yorker with this crowd here being in the financial center of the world and one of the tech centers of the world. Um, so Ross is correct. This is possible. And uh, the Lightning Network is a technology that enables instant high volume transactions over Bitcoin. You can think of it as kind of this second layer, as we call it, or um, a transaction layer operating on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. So today on the internet, and by the way, I'm a tech geek. Uh, I come from the, the land of magic internet money, as we say, in the Bitcoin world. Um, today on the internet, it's really easy to send a photo in any application to somebody anywhere around the world instantly, right? You can do it in text message, you can send it um, you know, via Twitter, um, WhatsApp, in a variety of ways, but why can't you send value, right? So being the internet geek that I am, in the early days of the internet, um, I wondered, you know, why can't you actually just send money, for example, I love music, to a musician, to a band, to a DJ, to somebody that created a video, and just embed it natively in the internet. So the goal with Lightning is to be able to natively embed value and payments in the internet. In fact, the early creators of the internet, Tim Berners-Lee, in the early 90s, envisioned that this would be the case. Back then, um, they created an error code. It's called HTTP 402 payment required, which is kind of like 404 not found. Um, it just was too early. So when I learned about Bitcoin, I thought, this is really cool. You know, will this actually scale? And will people be able to use it to natively embed payments on the internet? And then I learned about the possibility of this second layer operating on top of Bitcoin that can scale it uh, to billions of people. And I was I was sold, and this was uh, actually back in 2014 when I first learned about this concept. Um, so a lot's happened since then, and I'm excited to chat about it today. So what is the a use case for, for the Lightning Network? Because you know, I think for many people, they look at Bitcoin, they see the price go up, but they, particularly, I think Americans, they don't see the utility of it. And, and I, I think the thing that's interesting about Lightning is it is bringing utility to Bitcoin. So why don't we talk about right, what Lightning can do. Why I was so excited. Definitely. Um, so Bitcoin's first killer use case or killer app is that of Bitcoin, the asset, right? So in 2009, Satoshi, you know, 3rd January 2009, the pseudonymous creator of Bitcoin, launched the Bitcoin network. And everyone's familiar, I'm thinking here today, with Bitcoin, the asset. You buy it, um, the price has gone up substantially. The community has a meme, we call it number go up technology, right? The idea that the price of Bitcoin will go up and there are only 21 million that ever exist. But what got me interested in Bitcoin was less of the asset element and more of the idea that Bitcoin can really be this internet of money. So with Lightning Network, we're actually building Bitcoin, the monetary network. And it's really about three years old. So Lightning uh, initially launched as a protocol in 2018 on the main Bitcoin network. We call that mainnet. My company, Lightning Labs, built some of the leading tools for developers to build on this technology. Um, and the goal there is to have internet native digital money. If Bitcoin is just the equivalent of digital gold or a digital rock, then we don't actually tap into the use cases where you can natively embed payments on the internet and have you know, programmable money. So the goal with Lightning is really to enable this. So you ask about use cases. So the way that I think about it, in the early days of the internet, people didn't envision the use cases that are commonplace to us today. Something like a Google, a Wikipedia, Airbnb, and Uber. That's the same for the internet of money. There are all sorts of use cases. For example, in-game uh, payments for indie video game developers, streaming sats or satoshis as we call it, for streamers, for podcasters, for people, creators on the internet. Um, we also have the ability to have cross-border payments uh, instantly with extremely low fees, adoption in emerging markets. So there are these use cases that weren't previously possible and then also people that did not previously have access some people think, okay, why do I need uh, Bitcoin today? I have my credit card. 
Well, there are billions of people around the world that do not have access to the existing credit card networks who charge something like 250, maybe even 300 basis points for a transaction. And we're actually seeing today adoption in many of these markets. Uh, El Salvador, some people may have heard, recently made Bitcoin legal tender. Today, Starbucks, there's a great company uh, called Evex Mercado, Mercado McDonald's, uh, one called OpenNode, and a variety of major retailers are using the Lightning Network today built on the technology that my company has created, which if you'd asked me a couple months ago if this would happen, I probably would not have believed it, but welcome to 2021. So there are huge opportunities for people globally that don't have access to the financial rails that we do here in the US. Um, so you mentioned like Uber and Airbnb, sort of disruptive technologies. It seemed to me that the thing that sort of exploded in my mind when I heard about Lightning was the remittance market. And can you just explain like how that works? So let's just say I'm sending money to someone in Mexico City on Lightning. Um, I just think people would find it interesting just, you know, how functional it is. Definitely. So um, there are some great uh, companies already out there. Um, there is one called Strike, another one called Paxful that are enabling cross-border payments with Bitcoin and Lightning. So the way that this would work is a user using a service could convert, say, U.S. dollars uh, to Bitcoin sent over the Lightning network. And Lightning enables these instant high-volume transactions. And then it could be converted back at the point of receipt to, say, peso. And you know you have Western Union and major players out there that are charging very high fees, especially for low value transactions. Um, you might have to physically go to a location. All this can be done with a smartphone, right? And we see in emerging markets, like a huge amount of smartphone penetration, many people have access to those. So in these markets, people are able to leapfrog over the you know, outmoded technologies to be able to adopt uh, instant high volume transactions over Bitcoin and Lightning. And one key element is People say, okay, volatility, that can be a question. Well, when you have it in transactions and you want to go from USD to Bitcoin over Lightning to another currency, you know, say peso, you actually aren't exposed to that volatility, which is key in that case. Of course, some people want Bitcoin. Um, I like to say Bitcoin is a millennial retirement account. Uh, I have a number of friends here in New York City. They are very short on dollars and they hold a lot of Bitcoin as, as part of their strategy. But it, you know, it depends on the individual. Uh, but in this case, Bitcoin is serving as like a value transport layer, as I like to think about it. And the vast majority of users in the future are likely will not know that they're using Bitcoin. They just think they're sending value on the internet and maybe denominated in their local currency. Um, and that's the way the internet works today. For example, people that use, say, email may not know that SMTP is a protocol underlying email. They just use their Gmail. Email's not even that cool anymore, right? But um, that will be the same with Bitcoin and Lightning and the internet of money. Okay. Um, so we mentioned El Salvador, just like I guess in the development of Bitcoin, which you've been, you know, a part of for a long time now. Big deal, little deal. Is it mass? Like, can you just, you know, I think when I think about what you're doing, you're really bringing Bitcoin to the masses. Like, what does this mean, Bitcoin being legal tender in a country? Definitely. Um, so my company, Lightning Labs, we're about 25 people these days, and we have a number of brilliant developers and credit, for example, to uh, my co-founder and our CTO. Uh, his name is Zalo Osanjokan, who is, uh, was born in Nigeria, came to the U.S. Um, when he was younger and has seen the value of all of this, especially with family back in Nigeria. Um, brilliant engineer. And um, so... If you had told me even six months ago we would have seen nation state level adoption of both Bitcoin and Lightning, I would not have believed that, right? Um, and it happened. And even though, you know, El Salvador being a small nation, six some odd million people, I believe it is historic and significant um, that this level of adoption has occurred. And um, a number of retailers are now using the Lightning network. And there, so Bitcoin, uh, the community loves Twitter, right? People are on Twitter. I'm sure you've seen a lot of that. And there was a tweet this week because last Tuesday was the launch of this uh, law in El Salvador. And a number of these retailers were using Lightning, the technology that we had built um, called L&D for my company. And a fee at Starbucks for a user paying over the Lightning network was five hundredths of a cent. 
which I thought was just incredible. I mean, compare that to the types of fees that people would pay uh, for the traditional, say, card networks. So um, there's a joke in the community about having, you know, paying for coffee with Bitcoin. And in the US, it is not necessarily hard to pay for coffee, but in many other emerging markets, the rails are not there and they're actually able to use the technology. So to me, I believe it is quite significant. There's also been a domino effect. Um, there's a great company out there called Galois, who's building an app called Bitcoin Beach. And this actually is what got the whole El Salvador movement started. They have a community in the south of El Salvador, a surfing community, where they've been using Bitcoin and Lightning for two years now in what we call a circular economy. So their vendors don't have access to card networks, but they have smartphones. So they're actually using Bitcoin and Lightning to send and receive money, and vendors are able to accept it. Um, and to me, that community is just the beginning. We've, that company has heard from so many other governments, communities around the world that are interested in this technology. So El Salvador is the first, it's certainly not the last, and I believe we will see a variety of other, particularly emerging market nations, move forward on Bitcoin adoption. So you mentioned Twitter, right, which is important in the Bitcoin community. The Bitcoin community sort of lives on Twitter. Um, no one or very few people, right, have done more for Bitcoin than Jack Dorsey, who also had the wisdom to invest in Lightning Labs. Um, Jack Dorsey, according to, you know, public reports, is about to integrate Lightning into Twitter. Can, can you speak about, to the extent you can, you know, what is forthcoming? Again, I, I think the thing that's really interesting is, is the utility and, and, and what, what services Lightning is, is empowering. Definitely. So I'm just speaking from kind of the outside here as an observer. And yes, Jack Dorsey is one of our investors and has been you know, incredibly helpful and also just somebody who really understood Bitcoin at the outset and seeing that it can be this native protocol for value and currency of the internet. And so I believe that fits into a strategy with Twitter, right? So part of what got me interested in Bitcoin aligning in the first place is this idea of uh, internet native digital payments and the creator economy. And you know what better place for this than Twitter? Yes, the, the Bitcoin community loves to, sometimes they love to have lots of fights on Twitter and debates. I've, I've definitely been in the middle of those. Um, but also there are a lot of people that um, will create tweet storms and post videos and have all sorts of really interesting, I mean, I learn so much from Twitter and it's a way for me to find really interesting links and research and discover new people. We've made hires for Lightning Labs um, from pe of people from Twitter and we uh, love memes in the, the Bitcoin and Lightning community. So the idea there is, well, okay, Bitcoin and Lightning enable instant high volume uh, low fee transactions around the world globally. If we were to use existing payment rails and I think what they would likely do is have a variety of options, some on the existing rails, some using Bitcoin and Lightning. You can get to far more people globally than you would be able to. And it makes a lot of sense. You have uh, a younger population as well that very much wants more Bitcoin. They want to be able to hold this. They want to be able to earn Bitcoin. Sometimes people say, well, I don't want to spend Bitcoin. But Lightning enables people, unlike, say, a Visa, sometimes people say, OK, Lightning's like a decentralized Visa. And there are elements of that. But you don't really earn money. On Visa, but with Lightning, you can. So we see a lot of really interesting use cases like the Twitter one, which will enable content creators to earn over Lightning. There's an incredible company called Stack, which enables people globally, Latin America, Southeast Asia, to earn Bitcoin over Lightning, performing small tasks like for AI and machine learning. There's another one called Zebedee for internet gaming, where today gamers in Brazil are earning more over Lightning with Bitcoin uh, than they would in a normal job for their salary by actually just doing what they love, which is playing video games. So we're able to unlock these incredible opportunities that would not have previously been possible, and that's where I see Twitter fitting in as well. So it's sort of like tipping, right? Is, is that a way to think about it, right? That if I post something you think it's cool, Lightning is going to enable you to, to, to tip me in Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, there are all sorts of interesting examples. People could um, participate, say, in certain campaigns as well. Um, there was a really incredible campaign recently where a group called Bitcoin Smiles in the Bitcoin community raised money for people in El Salvador who could not afford dental work, hence Smiles. And just, you know, this community, people, by the way, they do this on their nights and weekends. This is not their job. They just love it and they really care. And so you could have charity contributions and things like that as well. I think there are a lot of really interesting opportunities. 
So I want to just scope out a little bit. As, as I think, I'm sure everyone can tell you're super enthusiastic about this. And the thing that brought you to it is sort of a, a passion for open source, decentralized networks. I, I don't, I can speak for myself, I, I don't think I fully appreciated the significance of a decentralized network until recently. And I would say the China ban on mining, you know, hammered it home for me. Um, but I'm probably still not as far along on it as I should be. Can you just speak to that? And I mean, I want to hear your answer. I'm sure other people do too as well. Definitely. Um, so the way that I like to think about it, uh, being the internet geek that I am, in the early days of the internet, folks may remember AOL, CompuServe, Prodigy, and the like, right? Those are proprietary networks. To have an AOL keyword, you had to go to AOL and get permission. And then there was a World Wide Web. And anybody could build on the web. And ultimately, it was the web that won out in terms of you know, all of the uh, incredible sites and businesses that have built, uh, been built on the web today. And I see the same for Bitcoin as this internet of money in that the ability for anybody to build on top of Bitcoin, you, know, you don't have to ask permission you're able to do so, and Lightning makes it easier for developers to build on top of it because you have these instant transactions as opposed to the 10 minute block time of Bitcoin. You have the scalability as opposed to the five to 10 transactions per second, and then you have the fees that can spike on the base layer of the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, so the, the open uh, nature of Bitcoin and Lightning means that it's available to people around the world. For example, there's an incredible uh, entrepreneur named Bernard Para out of Nigeria, uh, who just built an application called Bitnob, right? And he just spun up a group of developers, and now they have this business, and they're building uh, for Bitcoin and Lightning, and he didn't have to go and get permission. It's just open. And now you can use the Strike app to actually send remittances to Nigeria because Bernard was able to tap into this technology and the Lightning network. And to me, that's what's extremely powerful. And then some people might ask, OK, well, there are all these other cryptocurrencies why focus on Bitcoin you know, as my company Lightning Labs and as our community um, in the Lightning Network community? And the answer is ultimately network effects, right? Right now, Bitcoin is the most secure cryptocurrency. It has the most hash power for miners backing it up. And folks are probably well aware it is the most valuable cryptocurrency with the most adoption around the world. And in emerging markets, it's even more so, by the way. In Nigeria, 32% of Nigerians uh, use cryptocurrency, the vast majority of which is, uh, is Bitcoin, and then something like 50% of Nigerians are 18 and under. So there's a very young population that is very excited about this technology, and we see that in other places, in emerging markets and around the world. And of course, here in the US, lots of incredible developers and builders on this technology. So my answer there is the idea that you have all these existing users, you have people that are building upon the technology, um, there's something called Metcalf's Law, and one of my uh, favorite researchers, Lynn Alden, has written a lot about that. Check out her macro research and her Bitcoin research. And she has a piece on network effects. And she talks about how breaking a network effect means if something uh, is not 10 times better, it will not break it. If it's slightly better, it's very difficult. So Bitcoin already has a substantial network effect. And there's a concept of Metcalf's Law, um, Robert Metcalf, who created this for networks and the internet. As each individual user joins a network, the value of that network goes up exponentially. So to me, the open, decentralized nature of Bitcoin combined with the network effects, and then you have Bitcoin, the monetary network, which is lightning, combined with Bitcoin, the asset, um, that creates this, this uh, virtuous cycle, and we call it a flywheel effect, which just keeps growing and growing. And we've seen a lot of network growth, a lot of people running these nodes on the network that are like servers and a lot of developers building on the technology and an increasing amount of capital that is deployed onto Lightning as well. So we have a minute left. Um, there, there are about 100 something million people that own Bitcoin. And there are projections that in four years that number will be billion, billion plus. What gets us from here to there? Right? That, that's right, that's S-curve stuff. That's an acceleration of adoption. What do you see as the driving forces for that? At the end of the day, real use cases for real people in those categories of enabling use cases that weren't previously possible and enabling access for those that previously did not have it. And there's something in the broader, you know, I'm in this cryptocurrency world in the industry, and in some cases I think people are working on uh, solutions in search of a problem, and I really care about solving real problems for real people and making this technology accessible. 
in the early days of Bitcoin and Lightning, even three years ago, it was hard to use. It was like command line based. It was like the early days of the internet. Now we're seeing it become more and more accessible, more and more usable. And I think in the early days, people underestimated the power of the internet. There's this great quote by an economist um, by 2005, the internet's impact on the economy will be no greater than the fax machines. Clearly, that person was wrong. And similarly, I think a lot of people underestimate Bitcoin and Lightning. But at the end of the day, I would highly recommend not to sleep on this technology, as my friend Max Webster wrote, because we're really at the beginning and there's so much left in store. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Thanks.